morning, everyone. Um, on behalf of the Edinburgh Chamber of Commerce, welcome to this morning's session. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jo Davidson. I'm Director of Policy here at the Edinburgh Chamber. Hi, Professor Joe, I see you there. Um, and I'm standing in for Liz McAreevy this morning, who is on annual leave and unfortunately unable, unable to make it. But that means that it's my great pleasure to host this morning's event which is the latest in the series of webinars that we've been doing with colleagues from the City of Edinburgh Council over the course of, of the last couple of months. Um, before I introduce the session and our speakers this morning, um, can I just start with some basic housekeeping? I'm sure we're all very familiar with the etiquette by now, but just um, if you could please keep yourselves on mute when you're not speaking. Um, the format of the session this morning will be we'll hear from our speakers first from the City of Edinburgh Council and then we'll, we'll do we'll do a Q&A. If you do have any questions um, while our speakers are speaking, please feel free to use the chat function and we'll bring those questions in when, when we're ready. Um, alternatively, at the end of the speakers sessions, if you want to ask some questions or make a comment, you can raise your hand electronically through the participants button at the bottom. Again, I'm sure you're all very familiar with that. Um, just with the number of people on today, we might struggle to see you if you physically raise your hand, but if you prefer to do that, we'll try and capture you there too. Um, and just finally to remind you that the session this morning is being recorded. So again, if you're not comfortable um, with being on camera, just please bear, bear that in mind. Um, so now I'm going to sort of quickly move on to the purpose of the session this morning, which is, as you know, focused on the Council Spaces for People programme. So some of you, I'm sure, are, are aware on the 14th of May this year, the City of Edinburgh Council Policy and Sustainability Committee approved a package of suggested interventions to make it easier for pedestrians and cyclists to move, move around the city. As well as providing extra space um, in recognition of obviously the new normal that we face in terms of COVID-19, the proposals also recognised the rise in active travel, which had been seen since lockdown began. Some of the measures that have already been introduced or are in plan, and I know that um, Paul and Dave will take us through these in more detail, are segregated cycling lanes and widened pavements, road closures in three city centre locations, looking at pedestrian priorities at crossings across the city, and also bus and cycle improvement schemes are in plan on two strategic arterial routes. And I know that um, these guys will talk about that in a bit more detail as I see. So, so to do that now, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers this morning. Firstly, we have Paul Lawrence with us. I'm sure most, if not all of you on the call will know Paul, um, but if you don't, he's the Executive Director for PLACE at the City of Edinburgh Council and joined in 2015 from Stockport Council. Paul began his local government career as Arts Director for Durham City Council before moving to Northern Arts as Assistant Chief Executive. He also spent 10 years at Newcastle Council as Head of Culture and later Assistant Chief Executive overseeing the city's regeneration and leading on major projects such as city science development. Paul is joined this morning by his colleague Dave Sinclair. Dave is a civil engineer. He has a number of years of experience in both the construction industry and with leading local authority service teams. He joined the City Council in 2005, managing local transport and environment functions across the city and he is currently supporting the delivery of the Spaces for People programme, so I know he's going to give us a bit more detail about exactly what that entails. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to, to Paul to kick us off this morning. Um, thanks, Paul, and welcome. Thanks very much. I'm very grateful for the introduction. Although it's slightly scary, always listening back on the low lights of your career. Um, but, uh, morning, everybody. Um, very pleased to be here. Uh, just maybe a couple of minutes introduction from me and then I'll pass on to Dave, who's the project manager for the Spaces for People um, uh, programme. And Dave will uh, give a presentation, we hope, if the technology works, um, which sets out the structure of the programme, uh, where we are and, and what we're trying to achieve. Um, as I say, just a couple of, of words from me, because um, maybe on the origins of the scheme and of some of the, the dynamics going on um, within the scheme. First of all, it's important to remember this is a national scheme. This isn't just the City of Edinburgh Council scheme. So um, this was a Scottish government initiative um, as uh, the beginning of lockdown kind of moved forward. Um, it was becoming very, very apparent, particularly in cities, actually, and I'm sure many of you may have experienced this personally, that when we were in that phase when we were um, all encouraged to do daily exercise, which of course we're still encouraged to do, 
Um, actually, on some of the most popular uh, parts of the city, to, to put it bluntly, there just wasn't enough space. And people were you know, first kind of encountering that idea of social distancing. There was quite a lot of conflict between um, uh, cyclists, pedestrians, uh, joggers and others. And, you know, the management of public space in Edinburgh is an ongoing challenge, partly because we have a huge amount of people wanting to, to get themselves into often very popular spaces. And uh, we, we can be quite busy Well, in a pandemic. What's the one thing you want to try and do to address that issue? You want to try and create more space. Uh, uh, the towpath by the canal being a classic example. I remember having a seminar with some colleagues probably towards the end of March going, look, it's dangerous there. It's dangerous. There's lots more people on bikes. There's lots more people, you know, taking a walk. Actually, there's not enough space. So simple objective. How can we create more space for people? I know that might sound a little bit um, simplistic, but really simple um, objective. And the Scottish government got the same thing, set up a national fund, which I think initially, Dave will uh, probably remember better than me, initially was a national pot of 10 million, which we bid into on the basis of the programmes that, that Dave is just going to outline. Um, we got half of it. The Scottish government then realised that actually um, th this was a very popular and very in-demand scheme and increased the amount of money um, available. Um, really important to remember these are temporary measures during a pandemic. Um, so we have, as many people on the call will know, probably the most ambitious uh, placemaking and active travel program um, anywhere in the UK. I've just been finishing a call before this with colleagues working on the George Street redesign program which maybe is a flagship, but lots of others um, as well. So we have a permanent active travel program, which is a placemaking program. Um, but this is temporary measures. These are temporary measures to try and create more space in a period of our history, I suppose, when that's what we need, more space. And therefore, Dave and his team have been busy trying to carve out that space whether that's for people walking, whether that's for people shopping, whether that's for people cycling, um, whether that's for people getting to places of recreation. Um, so Dave will talk through that um, in a moment. That, that's what we've been trying to do. Last point from me, that there are, you know, you don't sort of need to read the, the papers and social media every day to realize there've been controversies and tensions within the scheme. Um, and I, I suppose that the, there are a couple of examples of that. The first is that there's been a huge amount of debate just recently about what the programme's been trying to do in the East Craigs area of West Edinburgh um, with the attempt to establish a low traffic neighbourhood, which I think it's fair to say has met with strong resistance from many local residents. And we're, we're trying to work our way through that just at the moment. And then secondly, there are areas, and perhaps more pertinently to this morning, where many businesses um, have felt as if some of the measures have put constraints on them, constraints on them in terms of deliveries and in terms of customer access. That's never been our intention. Our intention has always actually been to create better trading conditions where there's more space for people, particularly to get to local high streets, because it doesn't need me to say this, local high streets have actually um, seen in some senses increased footfall during this period at the expense of the city centre primarily uh, because obviously less people are going into the city centre for work which is a, a whole different story of a, of a different webinar I would have thought. So we've been trying to strike a balance between creating space on the one hand and ensuring the meet needs of businesses can be met and Dave and his team do that on a daily basis and I am more than aware that uh, many businesses don't feel that balance is right that's one of the reasons for Dave and I coming this morning. And our commitment is a simple one, is to keep an open dialogue with any business who's impacted by these proposals to try and see if we can find a way to reach appropriate um, solutions and compromises. Probably with that, that's probably enough for me as a few words of introduction. And I'll pass over to Dave to talk a bit about the detail of the programme. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for the introduction and good morning all. Uh, as Paul mentioned uh, and in, in the introduction, I. I uh, joined council in 2005 and I was working for the, about the first was seven years or so working in the city centre. So I know the dynamics of the city centre well, um, leading some transport and environment functions during the festivals, etc. Thinking of you know, things like street cleaning, some of the really kind of uh, challenging services that we have at these times. 
Um, I moved to the northwest of the city uh, a few years ago, and again, managing um, transport and environment functions during that period. So it was in, in sort of June, May, June this year, when uh, I was asked if I would project manage the delivery of the Spaces for People team. So as Paul describes there, it's a kind of, it's a range of, of various functions. Um, and Rebecca, I put together, as you know, just a few slides. I'm not sure, and unfortunately, I'm on uh, my phone, so I can't see actually if you're sharing it, but I don't know if there's the, the sort of second page on the slides, which is just titled Spaces for People. Uh, yep, which is just a, a summary of the, of the elements. So kind of, I'll go through this and then um, I think try and explain, I suppose, the nuance, the challenges, um, and what we're trying to achieve in the, on each of these elements. So, so as Paul mentioned, um, the, the bid that we submitted back in April was for £5 million, um, which was originally for a £10 million um, kind of fund across the, the, the Scottish area. Uh, that was increased to £30 million. Where we, we, so we, we secured a £5 million grant, and, the, and it's for temporary measures. So it was based on the principle, this sort of legal principle of you know, reducing the likelihood of danger to the public. That's the kind of legal powers that we have under the, the, the legislation in terms of introducing temporary traffic orders. So the five main work streams um, are elements in the city centre, and you'll probably be quite familiar with those. And those are mainly in terms of creating space, for additional pedestrian space and creating additional cycle segregation. There are some new schemes and some changes that we have planned in that area. And I'll go over that in a moment. Town centres, as Paul, again, as Paul mentioned, uh, you know, in terms of the, the change of dynamic and um, I suppose in terms of shopping and those elements, town centres, I think, are more important than ever. Um, and where we are genuinely trying to create safe spaces for people to shop, for people to dwell and linger to sort of manage you know, servicing and access opportunities as well, so that, that we don't unnecessarily um, restrict um, availability for, you know, for, for businesses to have deliveries, et cetera. And that's a fine balance and you know, happy to, to take questions on that later. Traveling safely is probably the biggest sort of banner that we have within the program. And that covers um, cycle segregation and the, the introduction of low traffic neighbourhoods that, that again that Paul mentioned thinking of Christorfin, Leith and the East Craigs elements and um, space for exercise at the very beginning of the program there were I think there were about eight very early interventions that we introduced and that was essentially closing roads in areas where we had links between population and open space and whether that be green space or just open space to make sure that that, that we could try and take the pressure off some of these routes where we had you know, a lot of people um, out about earlier on in the year. And I recognise you know, that the, the landscape around us is changing a little bit at the moment. And the final one is measures around school. And I think it's been fair to say it's been you know, incredibly well received. I think we've got 133 primary schools you know, across the, the Edinburgh Council area. And we're trying to introduce measures on, on, on I think, nearly all of those. And I think we're, you know, we're well up into the 60s and 70s now. Um, and we'll continue to push and, and actually put additional resources, I think, into that team to to, to push those measures through. So as, as we've said, you know, these are temporary measures. Um, they, we are, we're deploying them under existing powers we have to introduce what we call temporary traffic regulation orders, which is, a, um, you, you may be familiar with more permanent orders where we, where we advertise and as a consultation process. There is no sort of formal consultation process in, in, on these elements. Uh, and to address physical distancing and to, to provide, I suppose, alternative ways for people to get around the city. And if that's walking or cycling, that you know, we've, we've tried to, to, to provide those um, options. In terms of supporting a safe you know, economic recovery, and, and that element for us relates very importantly to the city centre features and the town centre features. Uh, you'll be aware in, in many of the town centres, we have you know, widened the pavements, we've, we've maybe in some circumstances had to take away parking, um, or move sort of servicing bays. Um, and the, the balance there for us is to make sure that we provide sort of clear space. The, the sort of criteria at the beginning of that was to think in, in areas where we had pavements that were less than three meters wide. Let's, you know, let's create where we've got um, the density of, of you know, shoppers in an area. Let's try and create space so people can, you know, can pass each other safely using the, you know, the sort of default two meter kind of distancing rule. Um, and, and that's the sort of the principle behind that. You know, I know I think we've fair to say, you know, we've had some, you know, some I suppose comments and criticism for some of the measures we've introduced in the town centres. 
um, and also in terms of feedback from community councils, I think you know they've, they've been generally well received. You have to think that that, that space is there. Um, Stockbridge is an example where we've not managed to introduce any measures yet. You know the community council are very keen to get them in because some of the payments are incredibly narrow, but I recognise it's a very fine balance of you know allowing or providing safe areas for people to to shop and visit. Um, but you know, providing an, an environment that, that businesses can can you know recover, and you know deliveries and servicing is, you know is is able to you know to to be delivered or to, you know, able to work properly. Um, the way we move around the city has changed. I think it'd be fair to say that you know, we we keep a, a a track on traffic flows and volumes across the city, and in general, in, if you compare a situation sort of like for like for the, almost this time last year. On all of our key routes, we no longer have you know, the traditional morning and afternoon peaks. We have a you know a kind of, sort of flatter um, sort of, vehicle, sort of traffic movements across the city, and we are we are sitting in general just below the, the sort of overall sort of daily traffic levels that we had before. Um, in the, in, I should say in the previous years, and Morningside is a, is a I an exception to that. And I think we have some sort of local closures in the area that may be causing some displacement of traffic. And as I mentioned, it's, it's to, to create more space around shops, cafes and restaurants. One of the things we want to encourage um, traders and businesses, particularly in areas, maybe for example, in the city centre, thinking of Victoria Street and Coburn Street. Um, and we you know, well, we know that those measures have been in place for a few weeks now and they're not quite right. And in recognition of that, we are looking at changes to both of those routes to either, you know, to either improve access, to provide more space, to animate the street better. So that we have maybe benches, parklets, um, and as I, as I mentioned, to just to, to one maintain good safe space for people to to, to visit, you know, and and, and shop, um, and two to maybe improve the environment for for traders, particularly thinking of access. Um, Rebecca, you can maybe just pop over to the to the next sheet. There's just four photographs there, and I, I just put the, these photographs in the, in the presentation just to kind of show some of the the themes. So. So top left, you'll recognise that's George Fourth Bridge. Um, we have widened the pavement and created a sort of protected, segregated cycleway. Now, I, I recognise, and you may want to, to talk afterwards, you know, that there are challenges there for servicing arrangements and servicing access. You know, that there, there are some areas in, in that particular um, project that are servicing and you know, waiting and loading is allowed. Um, and sort of making use of the sort of central reservation median, but we kind of recognise that it's, it's a change in you know road layout um, and, and has some challenges. Um, top right, uh, that's the you know, sort of bottom corner of Victoria Street, just from at West Bowl, looking up the hill. And this is a closure at the moment, and we are considering changing the access layout and changing the you know the, the overall layout on, on, on this particular street to to one protect it, you know, as a as a kind of very, I suppose, popular street, an area where the pavements are quite narrow to encourage people to, to you know, to shop and to visit there, but two, to, to improve the access. And again, we can discuss that in more detail. Bottom left, I think that just shows a couple of examples of the um, tables and chairs opportunities that, that we've kind of created onto the public streets or onto the roads. It's a, I suppose it's a new concept for us to, to very, you know, continental concept that we recognise and, you know, all, all of the European cities across, you know, across uh, our, the places we visit on holiday. We've never really allowed tables and chairs onto, onto the road itself recently, but we recognise that, we you know, in terms of reduced, you know, traffic flows, and particularly in areas where we have closures, for things like Coburn Street, Victoria Street, again, as an example, to encourage where we possibly can um, traders, if they want to create you know, uh, a, a good and safe public space. I realise it's maybe not the ideal time of year, but a good and you know, good and safe space to encourage them to to uh, take opportunities of that. And again, just finally on bottom right, it's not, not a great photograph, but um, that is Waverley Bridge, an area where we've created a pedestrianised area with access, with lots of local access arrangements. And I think, you know, I, you know it, clearly it, it, there are, um, so there's challenges with particularly thinking of loading buses and um, their, their, you know, their kind of their stance in terms of their, their tour buses and airport buses in terms of movement for those sorts of things. And we always are all of all of the schemes that we consider, we go through an internal kind of design peer review group and we invite loading buses 
um, to, to that group so that we make sure that, that we don't um, you know, unnecessarily disadvantage public transport. And I recognise that you know, the, the advice and use of public transport is a challenging one at the moment, but hopefully as the, as the you know, weeks and months progress, we can, that public transport patrons can increase. So as a, as a closure or a sort of type of pedestrian or closure or on Waverley Bridge, um, I think it sort of strikes the balance of allowing access, allowing vehicle access, but it's not a through route. So it kind of reduces those, the, the, the challenge with intrusive traffic. Um, is it okay, Rebecca, just to pop on to the next sheet? Which, um, apologies, it's not, not my finest work, but essentially it's just a, a kind of a layout map of some of the interventions within the sort of central part of the city. And so the, the reason I'm sharing this with you is, is we've, we've generally tried to collate together quite a, a coherent plan of different measures. And the different colours relate to different things. So you see this is a collection of different colours within the, within the this essentially sort of the old town footprint um, at, that includes some remaining work on, on South Bridge, sort of Chamber Street that, that, that we are developing. But it's, as I mentioned, the, under the, the sort of city centre programme to make sure that we have a, you know, safe areas for widened pavements and that we don't unnecessarily, you know, endanger cyclists or other road users um, in those measures, make sure that we have um, good facilities for, for loading buses and other public transport services and, you know, including taxis. Some of the other lines that you see sort of on our main arterial routes, the, the, the dark green, for example, um, are um, cycle segregation schemes that, that we've, we have approved already. And we have a, a program with the introduction of cycle segregation on the majority of our key arterial routes. There are some exceptions in there, like, you know, Leith Walk, et cetera, and Easter Road. There are some routes that we've just kept, you know, we've kept away from just because of the, you know, the pressure and um, sort of increased uh, uh, kind of challenges on some of those routes. The blue sort of dashed lines are, again, our arterial routes that we're going through sort of the approvals process you see um, on the A1 corridor from sort of London Road all the way out through to Durrington, the introduction of um, bus um, priority measures. Um, and again, a fairly light touch in terms of cycle segregation on the opposite side of the city, likewise on the, you know, on the A90 corridor and the A70 corridor you know, heading out towards Juniper Green. So they're, they're all schemes that were kind of under development. The, the sort of dark green ones that you see are, are schemes that we have approved and likewise, you know, they, they are some cycle segregation schemes. Um, and there are some others, you know, slightly further out um, in, the, in the city. And you can't quite see it on, on this plan very clearly, but the, we have you know, the nine town centres, you know, we've introduced features and measures in, in, in most of those um, to strike that balance to provide, you know, safe space and, a, and a, an environment that, that traders can operate over you know, successfully. So I think I think that's almost. Uh, I, I wanted to mention. I think the final slide, Rebecca, is just contact details. So there's a link there to our web page that, that we try to keep um, up to date with um, the consultation exercise that we undertook. We had over four thousand responses in terms of a, a consultation that we that we undertook in partnership with SusTrans, and we've used those that feedback to I suppose, inform the decisions that we're making on our current schemes and consider what other what other schemes that we that we consider to take forward um, and at the bottom there there's the the spaces for people and um, email address if you want to drop us a line with any sort of comments or, or queries either you know i suppose either myself directly or, or through the this email address is probably the best one so so thank you rebecca and joe that was all i wanted to mention this morning thank you to, to paul and to dave for that very so comprehensive review of what's obviously quite a, a complex and, and far-reaching program. Um, I'm going to open the floor to, to, to questions and answers very, very quickly, but just a few points from me, first of all. I mean, obviously, there's quite a lot to unpack and quite a lot of changes are or have already been made and are still in the process of, of, of being made. Um, but I think, as, as you both touched on, obviously, some of those changes have not been without controversy and, and challenge. Um, you know, and, and I know that, for example, and you know, and some of our members have have sort of fed back around, um, particularly some of the consultation pieces and some of the notice pieces and the communication pieces. I think, which is hopefully something we can unpack a little bit more more today. Um, 
but you know, I think that um, you know, from from our perspective, I, I don't think anyone would disagree with the the sentiment behind it in terms of obviously things have to be different now. We have to do things differently now, and and safety and well being has to be to be first priority. Um, but it would be good to maybe unpack some of some of those issues as 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 part of of the discussion. Um, so I'm I'm going to kick us off if that's okay um, with a question that has come. Um, from from Joe Goldblatt on the chat. So Joe, I don't know if you want to ask this yourself or if you're happy for me just to, to sort of ask it on your behalf. Well, I think I'd be happy to, to ask it if that's all right, Joanne. Sure. Good, uh, thank you, Paul and Dave. I have to say as a citizen of our inspiring city, what a pleasure it has been during the pandemic to actually walk through our streets which um, were empty because um, of the pandemic and to re-appreciate and re-fall in love with the city that has been my home for 15 years. My question has to do with the Edinburgh Christmas and places for people. I think as Joanne said, most of us support the general aim of the importance of places for people, which I call places for everyone, which means businesses as well as, as um, citizens. But can you tell me what your plans are now that the Edinburgh Christmas has been minimized or, or um, canceled for this year? And also what your future plans are, your thinking for Princess Street Gardens for private concerts as well as um, for uh, other civic events. Thank you. Just, just the easy questions then, Joe. Thanks very much for those. Um, uh, on, um, I'm happy to update on, on Christmas and Hogmanay, and actually it's important maybe to clarify some people um, uh, use those terms interchangeably. Uh, the council has two contracts, uh, I'm sure people will be aware, with Underbelly Limited. Um, the first was the delivery of Edinburgh's Christmas, which is not exclusively, but primarily focused around East Princess Street Gardens, Christmas markets and so on, um, on public health grounds uh, that has sadly been cancelled um, for this year. So any controversies around planning applications and, and all the rest of it and the erection of a big wheel and so on, all, all, none of that is happening, I'm afraid, because we took very detailed public health advice and the view was simply that, that was encouraging people to gather even in an outdoor location uh, uh, in a way that will be very, very difficult to manage. So it depends on your point of view. Some people are very pleased about that. Many people are, particularly from the business community, are, are concerned about that. Um, the decision on um, Hogmanay events uh, is yet to be taken. Um, our contractor underbelly have been rethinking. Probably everybody will be used to the street party and so on and so forth, torchlight procession. Um, those discussions are ongoing, Joe, and are happening um, uh, this week. Um, uh, Underbelly have come back with some alternative proposals, and again, we are evaluating those um, from a public health and a public safety perspective. So um, Christmas, um, as it was, um, is not happening, um, but um, uh, Hogmanay is still under discussion. We've been very keen to say that despite the, the organised side of Christmas not happening, is that, you know, clearly it's a hugely important time for businesses um, economically. Um, and we, we need, you know, to encourage people to uh, support their local businesses. Clearly, that is extraordinarily <laughs> difficult when very large chunks of the hospitality sector is closed. So what the First Minister um, announces, um, I'm not sure when it will be, but maybe this week or next, in terms of the possible um, reopening of the hospitality sector, and then how we support that, whether through marketing, whether through events, whatever it might be, is something we're keeping a close um, eye on. Uh, the council actually doesn't um, put any direct cash into the Christmas event, so it's not as if with Christmas being cancelled, uh, or the Christmas events, should I say, being cancelled, there's a chunk of, of money sitting there waiting. That The public money we put into it is into the Hogmanay events. So if, if for example, the Hogmanay events as, as revisioned by um, Underbelly don't go ahead, then there's the opportunity to rethink what a relatively small sums of public money might be available but we need to see what happens on the public health side of that and we need to see what the first minister says in terms of 
um, the reopening of the hospitality um, sector. Certainly elected members, the council leader, Adam McVeigh, has made it crystal clear that he wants people to support local businesses, particularly, I would say, local independent businesses, but all local businesses through the holiday period, which is obviously so important um, uh, for uh, businesses survival i would say at the moment so i'm happy you know to, to come back and and talk about that in a bit more detail when things are a bit clearer on the um uh, uh east princess street garden side of things or princess street gardens in general um uh, obviously there's been lots and lots of discussion about holding events in the gardens i think everybody was very uncomfortable about the state of the east gardens from an environmental perspective after last year and we are working on a new uh, public space management plan, which will determine what can happen where. On the West Gardens, which is where the uh, concerts have been held for the last two summers, promoted by um, DF Concerts, we have given permission for those outdoor concerts to happen next summer. Um, uh, but obviously that's dependent on the public health position at the time. And more generally, Joe, I'm in constant dialogue with the festivals about what their model for next year could look like depending on the public health condition uh, situation because clearly use of outdoor spaces you think of the fringe is a pretty obvious example uh, use of outdoor spaces is is going to come even more important so we are working with them on some kind of plan a's plan b's plan c's as to how edinburgh can uh, move forward with its festival status next year but given the wider uncertainties, it's very, very hard. But I do think use of outdoor space is obviously going to come into play in some ways much more so than use of indoor space. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe and, 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 and Paul, for that for that honest answer. We've had another question on, on the chat coming through um, from Johnny Can Ross. Um, and Johnny is asking, um, about the, the temporary nature of, of the changes and, and both yourself, Paul and Dave, you've, you've emphasised that both during your conversations. Um, how temporary are those changes in terms of time frame, and, and, what, um, and, and do they need to be temporary? And can we have your thoughts on these becoming longer term or, or permanent? Yeah, there's a tricky legal side to that, which Dave is probably much more expert on than me. The, 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 the legal powers we're using for these measures are temporary traffic road orders, as um, Dave has said. And uh, I think legally those can only stay in place for 18 months. Um, plus, it, you know, the whole rationale of this program was um, to try and create more space in a pandemic. Um, and obviously, as everybody's seen, the, the, the shape of the pandemic has changed. You know, we had the initial lockdown, then there was something of recovery. Now we're in this period and so, the way in which kind of measures we take mirror, if you like, the stages of the pandemic is, is really quite hard to manage. If some of the measures that we've got in place on a temporary basis now, um, so these temporary roadways cannot go longer than 18 months by law. Um, we, for example, uh, if people have found this helpful, we used a temporary road order for the closure of Leith Street, if people will remember, during the height of the uh, Edinburgh St. James construction period. And what we couldn't do is lots of people saying, oh, this is closed. It should stay closed permanently. Well, the law doesn't allow that. You can only do it for 18 months. If any of the measures we've promoted just now, if they are popular and, and there is support for them to move forward on a permanent basis, then we would have to promote those changes using um, permanent um, uh, legal orders. And there's a separate process for that. We could do that. So if, I don't know, the cycle lanes on um, wherever it might be, um, going down towards the Western General, for example, um, or going to the ERI approving popular, and in general, both uh, local communities, so residents, businesses, and other stakeholders see those as something they want to be permanent, then we could promote a permanent um, road services order to uh, change the road layout on a permanent basis, but it would be a separate legal process. Dave, I've, I hope I've got that right. Yeah, indeed, absolutely. I think the, the, the powers that we have, we're using them to introduce generally what we call waiting restrictions, which is essentially yellow lines. 
we, we don't need any change. You know, the, the authority can, can introduce segregated units, for example, say it was segregated cycle units or, or a, say a widened pavement in you know, I suppose a, a, a town center. We don't actually need to, to, use, to, I suppose, deploy any of the powers to introduce those things, but to, to introduce maybe waiting restrictions or yellow lines around it. That's where the temporary traffic regulation order comes in. So I suppose that there is a very cl close relationship between the two. So absolutely, I think as Paul describes there, if in an area that you know they land well, and we think there's something that that you know it's a feature that we maybe consider as a more you know permanent uh, element. Um, one thing we do need to be careful in terms of you know that there's no consultation process in a temporary traffic regulation, order, and there is quite rightly for a normal traffic regulation order. So people can can share their views, raise objections, etc. It's a, we, we, I suppose we shouldn't contrive the law to slot one straight into another. We need to be very careful about that. So but absolutely, they are temporary up to a period of 18 months. And, and, and I think the view would be to consider over that 18 month period, you know, how, what, what does the pandemic look like, you know, in terms of the landscape around us? You know, do we change them? Do we reduce them or increase the, you know, the, the kind of the prevalence of, of the measures that we have? Thank, thank you both for that and Johnny for the question. Um, Kieran Smith has raised the question on the chat, which is aligned to the to the question that, that Johnny has just just asked. Kieran, would you like to introduce your point and then we'll come to Fiona. I know so Fiona's got her hands up in, in the chat, so we'll come to her next. Yes, Joanne, thank you. Um, yeah, my, um, well, my initial point is I would argue there probably is enough space for activities, um, green space and routes in the city. Um, I think it's more about the management of how the routes perhaps are better utilised, how green space is managed and I guess more connected. Just, just sorry, say a bit elaborate. more. Sorry, to elaborate, basically I'm, I'm active. I use the city um, as a pedestrian, yeah. I commute, I walk, I cycle, and I do drive. And I've never really come across overcrowding pre-pandemic or, or during pandemic. I think it's an education of the spaces and how they're used. So as a Leith resident, let's take the links for, it, for example, um, it's how that's used better for activity, for personal use, and for travelling and connecting through. Okay, I, I, I that's a really interesting point actually, and I'd be really pleased to hear other points of view if the, if there's time. Um, I mean, I'm a Leith resident as well as is as is Dave, um, uh, and um, I think you're right that the links. I wouldn't describe any point as as overcrowded. Um, I think we other other places in the city certainly since I've been here, um, as Dave said, we've got very narrow pavements, which are very popular right across the city. Leith Walk, for example, is an exception because of all the work we did here. Um, uh, but it, it, there are places in the city, both the city centre and other parts of the city where, where crowding is a problem. I was uh, once made, I think, the front pages of the local newspaper by saying at one of our committees. Now, admittedly, this was admittedly this was during festival time, but I, I maintain it actually in other parts of the year that there are parts of the city where, because pavements they're very popular and pavements are relatively narrow, I've often been worried about the safety of the public. This is pre-pandemic, um, uh, where, for example, vulnerable people end up kind of using the the roadway uh, to get past other people, uh, busy with buses. And I've, I've constantly been concerned about the safety of the public. So I think we do have some problems. Um, the pandemic accelerated those. And even in Leith, um, some of the cycleways that are very, very popular in the city, and we're delighted they're so popular. But in the first kind of three weeks of the pandemic, the amount of people on them, and you saw these, for example, with the use of the Just Eat bikes, the amount of people exploded. And if you see now when you're using our paths and our parks, we've got signs up everywhere saying, paths for everyone which is encouraging people to just be considerate of each other's space because they're so popular and that's pedestrians I mean I've regularly I cycle and I walk and I regularly see cyclists you know let's be honest um, impeding on the space of pedestrians and people pushing buggies and so on just being a bit nervous so I, I think that the pandemic meant the areas where there was crowding um, uh, accentuated some areas and certainly in some of our town centres, because people were going to the city centre less, um, you know, you were seeing some of our town centres, Portobello, Castorfin, and so on, where actually Queensferry, um, Queensferry, South Queensferry is a great example, which Dave's been working on a scheme for the, the redesign of the high street there, where actually it remained quite popular throughout, um, but it was very, very busy. 
And it, the best way to manage public space is to create more public space. I suppose that that's our, our, our bottom line. But whether it's education of the public through, and we've been trying to do that, education is perhaps a strong word, whether the encouragement of, of, of the kind of right sort of behaviours, we've been trying to do that, but fundamentally creating more space. Um, uh, you know, I was in Morningside yesterday um, for a conversation Dave and I are possibly going to have later today about some of the measures there. And, you know, it, it's busy. And, and managing those spaces when people need more space is is challenging, but I'm, I'd really welcome people's perspectives on that. Great, thank, thank you for that, Paul, and, and an open invitation there in terms of further conversations. You've had another message of support on the chat from, from Johnny again, who appreciates the widening of, of pavements. Um, so, so you can take that as a measure of, of support <laughs> there for him. Um, can we come to Fiona next? Um, Fiona, you've got your hand up, and then we'll come to Stuart Turnbull, who's raised the question in the chat. Thanks, Joanne. Um, yeah, I think th thanks very much both for the clarification on the, the temporary TRC. I think, you know, realistically, we probably expect that a number of these, these things will become permanent in future, depending on how well they've worked. And I think the other thing that you've said, which I think is really laudable, is, do you know what, we're trying some stuff. It might not always be right, but let's keep the conversation going about where it's not right. And I think that's so important just now because the pace of which some of this has had to move um, it won't be right all the time so I think you know from an operator's point a bus operator's point of view um, that's really important I think one of the things I wanted to, to kind of touch on and, and it probably maybe takes us slightly out with the spaces and people but it is connected you know obviously we're aware there's a lot of messaging in public transport just now and that messaging about avoiding public transport as far as possible is is much more related to actually avoiding multiple households being in the same place as opposed to public transport isn't safe to use because there's no there's nothing that demonstrates that and as we know the operators have put a lot of things in to make sure that touch points are clean and everything gets deep cleaned on a on a, a daily basis so i think you know once we are through this pandemic which hopefully won't be too long I suppose my question is, are you thinking about how you start to encourage that bus use and think about that terrible C word of cars that starts to kind of play into how do you manage low emission zones? How do you get the green targets in there? And how do you maximise people on public transport, not just walking and cycling? And, um, you know, I think Edinburgh is well placed in terms of bus lanes but trying to deal with some of those congestion issues. So it's maybe a step on from where we are just now, but I think it is connected. Another nice, easy question for a Monday morning. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks Paul. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I agree with everything you say and, and the Spaces for People programme, you know, as we've tried to articulate, is very much tailored to the specific circumstances we're in now. But that wider agenda that you point out is you know super important to to the city um the issues of um a, 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 a transition to, to a net carbon zero society and economy are you know of the utmost importance um and and won't go away um uh issues around addressing poverty and inequality and there's been obviously a lot of talk about that in edinburgh just recently with the publication of the Poverty Commission's proposals where um, both the costs of housing, but you know, the, 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 the bus network is of critical importance to that, of people being able to use the bus network from to get from where they live to, to where they, they hopefully will work in the future. You know, so the mobility that buses provide in Edinburgh is second to none. And how we um, uh, reactivate that and, you know, all, all that stuff is about, I suppose, economic recovery, taking account of those issues, um, not setting them to one side. Um, we're due to publish a new transport strategy for the city early in the new year, which we're calling a city mobility plan. Deliberately, we're talking about mobility because, you know, there's actually a different with transport. You tend to think about the modes, whereas mobility for me is more about where people want to go. Um, we're working on that at the moment. We want that to kind of knit a lot of these things together, Fiona. So um, issues of congestion, issues of, of uh, modal shift, um, particularly for us, actually, and it, the, the, 
dynamics of this in the economy post pandemic will be really interesting. The relationship between the city and the wider region, where much of our labor market has drawn on West Lothian, on Fife, on East Lothian and so on. And, and whether that will localize labor markets post pandemic or whether that kind of wider dependency will continue is a really interesting question, I think. So those wider issues of regional dependence, as I say, of modal shift, of more active travel, of better conditions for bus, of how we uh, look at any um, ways of managing demand, whether it's in three things like low emission zones and so on. Um, we're going to set all that out together in this city mobility plan, which I'm hoping oh, will good. be February. Um, I'm always a bit wary of saying things like February because then it slips and puts pressure on. But we're, we're aiming for that to try and, if you like, put a new vision for mobility together uh, where we can bring a number of these policy strands in, into one place. I appreciate that. Thanks, Paul. Thank you both for that. Um, we've had another question come from Stuart Turnbull. Stuart, I hope you're still with us. Um, are you are you still there? Uh, I hope. Hopefully, I'm. I've had problems, yeah. connection problems this morning. I keep ducking in and out. Uh, so apologies for that. Hi, Paul. Um, Hi, it was really just picking up when you, you made the point about the, the measures being temporary and the legal uh, legal restrictions there. But just thinking longer term about the fact that you know it's all about reallocating road space and much of the city centre transformation project is all around those same principles. So what are your thoughts in terms of the longer term impacts in terms of city centre transformation, given the lessons I guess we've learned over the summer, you know, in, uh, in terms of the measures that can be put in and does it, is, it, is it positive or is it going to impact on the, the longer term strategy? Um, again, nice, easy question. Um, uh, uh, a positive, I would say, I mean, you know, it's. It, well, it's very hard, I think, to talk about positives at the moment because the situation is so challenging for everyone, both from an economic point of view and, of course, more importantly, from a, from a health point of view. But the city centre transformation proposals, which were about creating a city centre, which was perhaps less vehicle dominated and perhaps where um, the quality of public space was significantly enhanced, um, uh, both for inclusion and economic um, advantage. I would say the period we've been in now makes those proposals even more important. Um, uh, and uh, I suppose, you know, to be absolutely honest with you, Stuart, the key thing for me of this, and we've had a lot of criticism for this, and Dave and his team have done a cracking job on it. The point about these temporary measures is we've been able to do them quickly. Whereas normally changing the layout of roads and so on takes years and some people will be familiar with the scheme that we've had around additional cycling measures from Roseburn into the city centre, which I think have been ongoing now for, Dave will correct me, uh, three, four years. And hopefully the learning from this period is if we're going to make changes, let's try and find a way of doing them more rapidly because the legislation and the design process is, is a cumbersome item. And I think people want change quickly. Now, the other side of that is people want to be involved in change. And people don't like change being thrust upon them without a chance to engage in and, and have a say in proposals. So I think, you know, from our point of view, we need to commit to that engagement process. But at the same time, we need to find a way of making things happen quickly and not take half a decade, but take, you know, half a year. Well, how, how are we going to do that? So those challenges of accelerating delivery while sustaining engagement that's probably two of the big things we, we've got to take away from all this. But in terms of the substantive proposals themselves, you know, we, we need to push on. Can I can I ask a question then, if, if that's OK? Um, so you talked, I mean, you've just talked there, Paul, about that engagement and, and needing to have that meaningful engagement. What what? What engagement have you had on? I mean, how, how are you engaging with people as these pro, pro, uh, these proposals are progressing and these new measures are being implemented? What is that engagement process like and who's engaged in it? And you know, how, how, how are you doing that on an ongoing basis as things change? Dave, do you want to pick that up? Yeah, indeed. Uh, um, just make sure my mic is on. Is the mic on? Yeah, yeah, we can yeah, hear you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, as Paul describes there, the, the measures that we're, we're installing under normal circumstances would take you know years and, and it'd be a much more 
I suppose, in nuanced in engagement process that we have with stakeholders going through. And as a function of the, you know, the emergency nature, we have actually restricted the, the, what we could describe as the notification period down to sort of one or two weeks. I mean, it originally started about a week, and then when we recognised that some of these schemes are quite complex, we've extended that to a sort of two-week notification process. And I, and I, you know, I suppose I reluctantly admit that's with quite a quite a tight and restricted um, sort of you know stakeholders group. And the, you know, the, and the purpose of that was to obviously keep that pace of change going. So I suppose a certain degree we we don't get. Uh, overwhelmed in terms of that, that you know, that, that sort of level of engagement. I absolutely recognise that you know the, the decisions that we're making are, are you know they're quite big changes, you know, big big you know significant changes in terms of realigning road space. What we recognise now is 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 we, we, that we try things, or we have we've always tried to do, but that we try things and when it's not right, then absolutely let's change it. You know, you maybe use Victoria Street as an example. I, I think we've got big bigger plans for Victoria Street to try and. You know, improve access, improve the trading environment, particularly thinking of the sort of you know the trading platform running up to Christmas. So um, it, it has been quite a tight notification process, but where we install features on the ground, then absolutely, I would encourage that, that we that we open up the channels with all our stakeholders, and particularly thinking of of, of your organisation, so that if traders are are suffering in terms of say access arrangements or you know servicing arrangements, then then please let us know. We have a we have a program lead. Who is looking after each element of the program, and I always encourage them to participate either, you know, in, in virtual meetings or absolutely you know, we're, we're on site quite often as well, potentially knocking on doors and visit, visiting either, you know, residents or or businesses. So I think I, I would make that offer, you know, to the you know the Chamber of Commerce that if there are any elements that you think you want to discuss, where we've introduced something that's not quite working, please let us know. That's great. Th thank you, Dave. And I think that's yeah. that's certainly a call to action for us um, and certainly a, an ask that you'd make coming out of today. And I know that yourself and Paula both emphasise this as, you know, that just, just to continue to be open to that meaningful engagement, that ongoing dialogue with us. And an ask also for our members, which would be to, to you know, to, to shout up, to tell us what the issues are. And obviously we'll make sure they get fed into the appropriate the appropriate point of contact at, at the council and, and we can help to facilitate that ongoing dialogue and engagement, which I know our members will, will very much appreciate. Can I can I close then this morning by thanking Paul and, and Dave most sincerely for their time um, and for their openness and for their willingness to engage with us this morning. As I say, you know, as a chamber, our task now is to keep that engagement ongoing and, and we will do that. Um, can I also thank the chamber team and the team at the council so who supported putting this event together this morning. Thank you to Rebecca and to Dave and, and, and the team at the Council. Um, and lastly, can I ask, can I thank you all for attending? I know Monday morning at the start of a school holiday period is not ideal timing, but um, a very important discussion and, and hopefully you've gotten a lot out of it as I know we have. Um, so thank you very much for attending and we hope to see you at a future Chamber event very, very soon and we'll keep you posted when the next session with, with the Council will be. So thank you very much again and have a lovely week.